Welcome to Dark Disney. Tonight, we uncover the shadowy corners of the Magic Kingdom. This is Dark Disney. Ask about the Illuminati, says the jar in yuppie ducks. Is it Disney mind control? Is this MK Ultra Deluxe? Is the jar in yuppie ducks? Is it Disney mind control? Is this MK Ultra Deluxe? Occult Disney, go wish upon a star. Occult Disney, Juno Park to Jafar. Occult Disney, go wish upon a star. Occult to the Occult Disney Podcast, where we go jumping through strange interstellar phenomena to see what secrets and mice hide within. On this side of the black hole, it's Matt. On the other side over there, living in his own personal hellscape, it's Thomas. How's it going? He's thinking about it. That doesn't impede your voice, though. Oh, he's going for the close-up? Okay. Great for an audio podcast. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess <laughs> the, audio. the audio version, it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, I guess we should explain that he's wearing a mildly terrifying Mickey Mouse skull mask. Is that what we're going to call it? Well, this is the Dark Disney series, right? So this it is, is the Dark, the Dark Disney, Disney mask. That's the Dark Disney mask. Okay. I was just trying to work out what they actually called it. It's reasonably unnerving to look at, I guess. <laughs> It would be a good walk around character at one of the parks to have have that. Do they do that sort of thing? And Disney's getting a little bit more into the haunts and stuff, I think, these days. Uh, not in Japan, though, so I don't know. Uh, they as do. far as the, they, they do, I, I can't remember. I think it's called Halloween Hard Nights, or that might be Universal. That's Universal's, but, but Disney yeah, definitely has one. Something going around at Disney. I, I guess it's less terrifying. I haven't done any of the haunts. Uh, I feel like haunts started to become a thing in like when did haunts start to become a thing? Mid 2000s. Yeah, I, I remember going to uh, not not one of the annual ones, but they had Ripley's Believe It or Not had their own little special thing that was always open. It was always one of these little like horror houses. And uh, I remember a few years after that, this early 2000s, that Six Flags had one at some point. So I think they've like been growing in popularity maybe, but now it's a thing. Like You don't even have a theme park. At least in Orlando, you don't even have a theme park unless you've got some kind of Halloween revamp for it for the entire month of October. And usually it bleeds into November. Yeah, one of the most... It's gotten so weird last year. Uh, there was the Dark Harbor, which is in um, uh, Los Angeles at the Queen Mary. That, and they're doing it again this year. But last year, uh, Shaquille O'Neal had somehow licensed the thing. And, and the whole horror experience became a Shocktoberfest with like... <laughs> giant Shaquille O'Neal's and like pirate costumes and stuff. Cause they still kept some of the water theme. So it looks like it was just extremely confusing. I heard uh, two people that went, one of them loved it. And one of them thought it was, you know, insane and stupid, but that still sounds kind of fun. I don't know. I think it might be Howlow scream. That might be Disney's. Oh, uh, okay. I'm trying to remember it. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I, I wasn't a fright guy. I mean, I went to a couple of, cause in the nineties when I was growing up, it was just like, the the haunted house you know by the old mall or something right uh, oh, that was go. open for a month 
right. I, I went to that Ripley's Believe It or Not one that I mentioned. I think this was in 2001. Yeah, it couldn't it couldn't have been too much later than that. And I would I mainline really, their museums. If I was in a town with one of the Ripley museums, even though it's a horrible favorites. horror trap, I oh, was in, by, yeah. By far. My, uh, Ripley, Believe It or Not museums are always my favorite. It was my favorite, one of my favorite comics kind of growing up. I would classify it a little bit as a comic. I remember those more than almost anything else. But I also realized in that, in that haunted house that I'm not compatible with them. I don't really get scared as much, but there was someone that was like, I was at the tail end of the party and there was someone that creeps up behind the back to like scare you from behind. And I wasn't expecting that. I'd never been in one of these before and I ended up checking the guy and I got escorted out immediately and I felt bad. I, I didn't do it like on purpose or out of ego. I just, someone jumped out behind me. I wasn't expecting it. I turned around and I kind of slammed him against like a little railing there. And they have a very strict, you know, no contact policy, which I agree with. <laughs> but yeah, I can't really uh, do those things because I, I don't know how to control myself from not pushing someone away if they're like coming out at me. No, uh, I've, I've heard people that do these things say that like now maybe it's more refined now. And they're like, OK, you don't come at the person directly in front or directly behind of them because they will punch you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it almost feels like I never had a choice. You know what I mean? Like my 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 reaction was just that. So, yeah. uh, especially I love in front, because like you you see where you're going. So if something is suddenly impeding your your um track there, and and it looks you know scary for a second, you're you might punch it, and that happens. You know, it was way scary to me, and and I'm sure that I can't necessarily separate how old I was versus the experience of having live actors that are junk. And I've been to a few of these where like you drive out in the middle of nowhere in Florida and it's just some warehouse, which are a bunch of random people that are running like a horror house. And they've got the guy with a chainsaw and like blood splatters all over and everything. But none of those hold a candle to some of the weird, creepy carnival uh, rides I had gone on. There was these one sort of carnivals where they would like set up and it would just be, a semi trailer, but you would walk in one end and it was all completely dark. And you have to like feel your way through the whole thing. And as you would go through, there's little laser trips and all kinds of things. So that a loud buzzer and like a light would show up and just like a head would pop up and then like slowly. And it was so, so cheesy, but it was so freaking terrifying way more than the, the haunted uh, sort of houses that you go to. And they're all theatrical. And cause at some point you're, I'm looking around those and I'm like, Wow, someone put a lot of effort into this. The costumes are nice. Like everything looks nice and weathered. It looks like an old sanitarium. But these freaking semis in some random county fairs, it was just complete blackness. And you're almost wondering, like, there could legitimately be a snake in here. And no one would really know if there was a real <laughs> snake or not. You know what I mean? Contact rule broken. Yeah, I, I remember that uh, the 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 Carney haunted house pretty well. Now, I guess my top haunted houses are um well the haunted mansions, of course, fun, but you, uh, I guess that is a cow in Florida. It doesn't count, but yeah, but in Halloween now they do the uh, Jack overlay, right? The nightmare before Christmas overlay, which it's kind of like, well, I, it's Halloween. I kind of want the, the normal haunted mansion. I don't want Jack. Maybe just do it for Christmas. I don't know. They do it for Halloween and Christmas. Really? I, I don't think I've ever seen it. Actually, it seems like something cool to see for Christmas, but yeah, maybe not. It, Halloween. It, it would make sense for Christmas, but yeah, in October, it's like, give me the, you know, the straight up, Haunted Mansion, right? Which I guess isn't that scary. The Rehoboth Beach, Delaware one. I've been through there a lot. Um, you know, it's it's a little more, well, a lot more chintzy and, and fun that way. Although the clown at the uh, outside of that fun park is probably scarier than the ride. There's a clown up in a in a steeple or something like waving, like and it has a really creepy smile. So I hope that's still Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. I don't know. You know, I loved clowns growing up. They never were scary to me. Uh, I understand if you saw like an it clown, that's maybe a little bit different. Like it's legitimately supposed to be scary. But whatever th that thing is where people report being scared of clowns, even when they were little kids, problem child, right? Wasn't he adverse to clowns growing up? I almost, I skipped that. Like I loved clowns. I had clown stickers. Like I, I got all the tapes. I would like watch the freaking Barnum and Bailey recorded um, like performances over and over when I was a little kid. I like Dumbo. Like maybe, maybe I like Dumbo first and then clowns came after. I'm not really sure, which would be terrifying because those clowns were kind of evil. And now we had a clown at my six year old birthday party. So I had a clown in my house, which sounds like inviting a vampire into your house. I was just <laughs> listening to a, 
another podcast where they made the distinction um, that maybe, you know, like a cartoon clown is fine. It's like a middle-aged 50s man who becomes a clown. That's when it becomes terrifying. Uh, look up the Sugar Snaps clown, for example. That is that is a terrifying clown that was on the Sugar Snacks uh, cereal box in the 50s. That, that will, That's a nightmare fuel there. Well, so. they've got the, the Ringling Museum here in Florida. That's actually where a lot of the, the carnies and side attraction people at the freak show, a lot of them ended up in, in a place called Gibsonton here in Florida as well. It's just like this little ramp off of a highway and then bam it's like the highest population of lobster men uh in the country but in addition to that this whole ringling museum i guess they had really deep roots in florida and they've got some pretty detailed uh like exhibits and little walkthroughs and everything of clowns and the whole circus um sort of like demographic and the clown exhibit it's pretty much all old dudes it's like uh very set it's got a very sad feel to it but that's kind of what you need to be to be a clown like you have to understand the absolute tragedies of life right in order to be a tr true clown like if, if you've never felt pain how can you even be a clown the day the clown cried didn't that movie supposed to come out this year finally you know what i'm talking about oh the jerry lewis's Joker. holocaust yeah. Yeah, movie which Okay, yeah. Oh, it's viewable now, is it? Okay. Oh, wait. We're talking about two different things that are actually the same thing. I'm talking about there's a musical Joker movie. Uh, but oh, no, 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 no. Holocaust. There's a musical Holocaust movie? I'm talking about, well, one, there was uh, Life is Beautiful, which won an Oscar. Uh, but this is the day the crown, crown Clyde. Clown cried. That's hard to say. Um, Jerry Lewis movie that was a Holocaust movie. And it was considered right. like unreleasable or whatever. And it was like impossible to watch, but it was a 50 year thing. So theoretically it should be available this year. If someone deigns to. And there is another publisher. musical Holocaust movie. I think if you can consider, was it called Jojo rabbit? Have you seen Jojo rabbit? I've heard of that one. That's a, that's when we're hit. There's like a character, like the boys, like a uh, imaginary it's friend. Not it's not a bad movie. I've heard, well, I've heard both views, but uh, I've heard someone say it's very good. That I, who's his opinion I trust. So if you like the director's work, then, you know, you'll appreciate it. If you, if you I, hate well, everything, I, say his name right? I don't know. That's why I didn't say, that's why I said the director. I don't want to, <laughs> <laughs> but if you, if you tend to not like it, then you probably won't like it, but I don't know. I'm, I don't hate his work. I kind of like it. Polarizing films. Well, uh, all that is to say it's dark Disney. We're doing their darker movies. I guess this is the lightest of them because it's a, it's kind of a okay. sci-fi. I'm, I'm well, glad because it didn't feel yeah. as dark as it could have been. No, but it gets pretty dark when you start thinking about it. And for Disney, this is this is their first PG movie. Uh, the Black Hole was their largest budget up to this point, which is only twenty million dollars. But I guess in nineteen seventy nine, really, yeah, yeah, they blew some money on this movie. Um, what else have we got in the production? There, there is a lot of interesting production stuff here. Um, it's considered to be basically the last studio movie because Disney did everything in house, including special effects. Like they wanted, you know the uh, new ILM to do it in the light and magic, but there was still, no, it wasn't very big yet. Basically they could do George Lucas's stuff and that was it. So uh, they had to create their own like computer tracking system to replicate what ILM would do. Uh, one of the last movies with the overture. I don't know if you watched a version that had an overture or not, but this in Star Trek, the motion picture, the, the last Hollywood movies to show up where you just sit down and it plays music at you for uh, three to five minutes. Right, yeah, that, actually, that was kind of weird. I don't remember seeing a lot of movies that do that, and it was like the black hole starts with a black screen for the first two and a half minutes. Yeah, you're like, is, is this broken? So it's it's good to know it's there. But um, yeah, it's the last one with that. The, the cast is pretty wild. But uh, yeah, this started out, it, it was following so many trends. It's going to be Space Probe 1 or something, and a disaster movie. It was supposed to be like the Towering Inferno or the Poseidon Adventure. But by the time uh, it's about going to production, okay. no, it, it changed a lot because in 1976, they're like, uh oh, these movies aren't so, are like losing in popularity now. So they're like, rewrite the script. So it took on this kind of a 20,000 leagues under the sea sheen instead. So that's the template for the finished product, not, not a disaster movie. So it's actually pretty shocking to hear that this was like one of the bigger, but the biggest budget, I guess, to this point. Is this including animated films? I believe so. I just, all right. I mean, <laughs> I liked it. I thought it was kind of uh, enjoyable, but I never would have expected this to have been one of the big budgets. I imagine this was a 
aside from the cast, uh, I don't. It's interesting to hear. It's it actually took me back a little bit. Yeah, um, I guess one of the. I mean, you see a lot of money on screen, but. Like it's a lot of matte paintings. I think it's because they had to build an effects house from scratch, things like that. Yeah. You know, that costs some money. So that's why you would hire ILM so you don't have to start from scratch. But that was not the case. Here. Well, it so. has all the makings of one of those movies where you fall asleep and you wake up at like 3 a.m. and then you're just trying to fa- fall back asleep and, and like a weird movie's on and you're like, it's not good enough to keep you awake, but it's interesting enough where like you might keep one eye open until you pass back out. This is kind of the the feel of the movie. Now I, I like the the messaging and the there's eye candy and everything to it, but it has all the pacing of like a like one of the slowest Twilight Zone episodes. If you were to just stretch one out for an hour Try and season 40 four, <laughs> Try season four of the Twilight Zone. Uh, there are some good ones in there. Um, yeah, actually, uh, two things. One, it's funny you were mentioning the the late night movie. You just kind of fall asleep through because I you know I had to watch this one completely. I was taking notes and then I put on like. I haven't seen this for 30 years, but I got I got deep impact on Blu-ray and I was watching that. But it also features Maximilian Chanel in it. So that was really confusing. <laughs> <laughs> so this movie as, feels like a little bit of a trailblazer in some of those ways, which I, I guess I'm retroactively looking at it and giving it even more appreciation than I would if I didn't notice some of the things that I thought were kind of cool Easter eggs or like uh first time I had seen things done in certain movies. Yeah, my history of this movie is, uh, you know, this was on the kids' shelf with the other Disney movies. It was one of the first Disney VHS releases, and it was one of the first Disney uh, Laserdisc releases, if you had a Laserdisc player, which I didn't. But, yeah, you know, it's like this is next to, like, the cat, the computer wore tennis shoes and stuff. So, obviously, it sticks out. It looks a little bit more mature, you know. It's PG. Oh, my God, it's not a G-rated movie. So, I, I'd rent this one. Um so I've probably seen this movie a good five or six times. The thing is, um, the like the pacing's not good. It's a little bit of a draggy movie. So you watch it a few years go by, and you're like, yeah, there was some cool stuff in there. Yeah, the box looks cool. The poster looks cool. And then you're watching, and you're like, oh, yeah, the pacing in this kind of sucks. There, there's so many cool things that happen in this movie. I, there's so many characters that are interesting. There, There's so much about it that I like that it almost makes me angry that the movie itself is not good. Uh, I'd, I'd almost rather just watch it like it were a bunch of AI generated clips mashed together instead of knowing that there was a script and, you know, production coordinator and like all those roles. And then it was the highest produced movie, right? Uh, the most expensive one up to this point. That that actually hurts me a little bit more now. Well, um, what's it? Gary Nelson's the director. Uh, let me, yes, Gary Nelson's the director. He was not involved with the project for most of its pre production. Um, he kind of, once it got out of disaster land, the previous director was like, eh, not interested anymore. But then Star Wars comes out. That fast tracks this movie. Oh, my God, let's get our sci-fi out. So I wonder if it is kind of just like the director was not the right man for the job. Uh, it kind of has that feel because the cast, I mean, again, Maximilian Chanel, Robert Forrester. Yeah, uh, you got honestly, Ernest I think you're 100% Gordon. on this, man. Like, there, there's nothing else they really could have done other than maybe a new director even the script wasn't horrible. In fact, the the script was fairly strong. If you ignore the the dialogue and the pacing and everything, but I, there's probably an edited version of this or a redirected version that could have made it phenomenal and not just. Eh. Um, I'm looking at his filmography. I mean, there's nothing here. Freaky Friday is the other standout, basically. Um, although I, from I do love one of those switcheroo movies. Yeah. 1983 to 1984 he and, and up to 1986 he made murder in Coweta County murder me murder you more than murder and murder in three acts so I guess he got kind of murdery um yeah. eventually <laughs> <laughs> those are all separate movies it looks like he did tv won an emmy for uh, sorry I just lost what he did won the emmy for um Washington behind closed doors ooh la la okay well we like to talk oh, about maybe that, he's got we? yeah maybe he's got some, some conspiracy stuff going on just yeah, to yeah. maintain a little bit of sanity going forward I'm gonna assume that most of the budget if not 90 percent of it just went to Ernest Borgnine and if and if that's what the case was then I'm happy and I don't even have to dwell on it anymore I guess his he's here because he is in the Poseidon adventure just you know maybe he was cast like a long time earlier i don't know um well and uh this was interesting too because ernest borgnine's not the first name that comes up in my mind when i think walt disney <laughs> just because 
He's uh, had a p- couple of really cool roles. He's had a couple of raunchy sort of statements <laughs> he's made publicly way after this movie was made, of course. Um, 1979, right? That's but right. In the 90s, he was also the voice of Murloc the Magician in DuckTales movie. So those, oh, those are the, the other example of Ernest Borgnine. But I want to imagine a world in which Ernest Borgnine was in more Disney movies. I actually think that that would be net positive across the board. Oh, yeah. You put Ernest Borgnine anything. You know, who's uh, we got people you can do that with today. Uh, Stanley Tucci, put him in anything. That's always fine, right? Um, what does uh, I'm thinking of a few names, but I'm not like landing on them. So, yeah, Borgnine's good. Uh, Robert Forrester, since I'm so familiar with Jackie Brown, seeing him not old is weird. <laughs> the, me too, man, because I know that he was an older actor, but that was the first movie that I'd seen him in. And I remember my dad making some comment like, oh, wow, you know, he's looking old now. But like the first time that I had really seen him, um, I don't know. He, standout role man i think that they had some uh, high caliber actors at least involved here i i'm not sure if i recognized who reinhardt was the evil mad scientist sort of like luciferian figure that that was uh, was killing it like he was doing awesome that was maximilian schnell who has the weird coincidence of having the same name as the darth vader robot um (laughs) He won Best Actor for Judgment at Nuremberg. Uh, uh, obviously, he was in Deep Impact, which surprised me last night. Um, I played Lennon in the movie Stalin. Okay. The man in a glass booth. I don't know who that is, Julia. So, yeah, I'm like he's the guy in the black hole, right? But, yeah, scenery-chewing master. And, uh, with, he did uh, great, man. Like, every time he was on, I felt like no longer felt like it was some random off-the-shelf straight-to-video, which I know it wasn't now. Now I know it was supposed to be this big blockbuster. Uh, but, yeah, he, he commanded performance the whole time. Of course, Ernest Borgnine. The other dude, too, a little bit less so. Um God, the younger one or Anthony Perkins? Psycho. Anthony Perkins, yeah. Anthony, it wasn't a breakout role for Anthony Perkins. I know we're doing a little like film review but I have to because this was such an interesting movie. We've got some good notes on it. But, we usually don't have on-screen actors to talk about, right? <laughs> but, yeah, actually, that's a very good point. And then how did it do commercially with, with being the highest costing movie to this point? It looks like it basically broke even like i actually thought it was considered a bomb so it's not considered successful uh there were supposed to be things after this movie um the most fun which is when this movie was in production and coming out they were working on a system with a military grade simulator they're going to make a black hole ride uh for disneyland because they were like Mm. this this is going to be our star wars so We'll put it in. That didn't happen. So yeah, that hurts even more to, to hear it phrased like this was supposed to be their Star Wars. Well, the funny thing is that the ride they developed was retooled into Star Tours. So we did get it, <laughs> and it is Star Wars. <laughs> so Star Tours was originally going to be a ride for this movie, which at the end, when they're going through and there's like, you know, you can easily see where this is a theme park ride because there's like a good five minutes of footage of them riding around on a ride vehicle with trippy stuff happening around them. That's your ride. <laughs> Yeah, no, 100%, even as he was uh, riding in this, and the way that the lever worked, and the way that he got out, it, immediately I was like, oh, that's an actual dark ride. Like, that's the, how those things operate and everything. But it wasn't a dark ride they were working on. They were, they were working on the simulator, which would, which, mm. so if you want to know what that's like, it's, it's Star Tours, so. But it sounds like there is legitimately now a way that Star Wars and Black Hole could potentially be combined into one. Like, Star Wars can do a Black Hole adaptation. I don't know if you would ever bring Black Hole back uh, without throwing that Star Wars muscle around a little bit. But they well, could just, uh, have they redone, I'm sure, maybe I'm already... Speaking of, like from past times, have they already remade this in a Star Wars episode? Uh, Joseph Kosinski, who directed uh, Tron Legacy, um, did he do the Top Gun Maverick? I think he did Top Gun Maverick. Um, you know, he's Tom Cruise's other guy now, but uh, he was going to remake this, but it was the script was considered too dark for a Disney movie, which to me seems like the hook of perfect. remaking the black that hole. Sounds perfect. Yeah. But the, the bigger nail in the coffin was uh, interstellar had their black hole sequence. And they're like, Oh, we can't do that now. So, you know, maybe in the next few years they might do it, but 2016 is like, let's not do it right now. Um, uh, this movie has also been called by Neil deGrasse Tyson more recently as the most scientifically inaccurate science fiction movie ever made. 
Oh, uh, well, okay. I mean, I'm I'm so happy we have him to tell us that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, part of that is that means that the black hole just turns into a weird metaphysical land, which is you know what we get to talk about today. Some, you know. Um, although, well, there was one other thing I wanted to mention, like what was going to happen with this so, after. So technically, out. if if that means that um, if we were to consider one of B.O.B.'s music videos about Flat Earth, Neil deGrasse Tyson still thinks that the Black Hole movie has less merit than Flat Earth Theory, which almost might be a, a revelation that he wasn't meaning to do. Yeah, or maybe he just hasn't seen every movie. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, he definitely knows of B.O.B.'s work. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, there was something else and I'm just like not seeing where it is. Uh, anyway, the, the ride was the most interesting legacy, but yeah, you know, they had thoughts of making other things. Uh, there was a computer games. So there were some comic books. Oh, here's one. There was a comic strip that came out with the movie, uh, which was illustrated by Jack Kirby. So that's kind of cool. You can find Kirby versions of uh, the black hole. Well, see, now I need to go down a rabbit hole in the black hole. Cause there's all sorts of cool little ancillary stuff that I wasn't even expecting out of this. Oh, and you know, how, over computer the years, games? how many there's it's, math teaching you math computer games. Yes. Where the um, Prospero or is that, what's the name of the ship? Uh, anyway, it lands on a planet and they, they all go crazy from a space gas and then you have to solve math problems to save them. So I don't know if you have the answer to this, but I'm going to make an assumption and correct me if you do know the answer, but I'm going to assume that all of these ancillary products were sort of in the works alongside the release versus the movie came out and they were like, man, this thing's doing gangbusters. We need video games. We need uh, rides. We need comic strips. We need more to keep these people satisfied. They won't stop chanting encore. Well, I guess uh, the, the, so the, other than the comic strip, there was also a comic book, which uh, only ran for four issues. The fourth issue is almost impossible to find. And it promised a fifth issue that never happened. So there, I there was relate. also yeah, I mean, I guess you can want, read all the stuff on the internet now if you really want to. It's it's pretty easy, but yeah, I had my run through all of X Men a few years ago. That was fun. Still gave up an executioner song, which I guess just means after Claremont's out, I'm, I, I lose my interest if you're an X Men geek. So, see, I I kept up. I kept up through pretty much the mid '90s until I just had other things to do. I came back for Grant Morrison and stuck around a little bit after that. So I, I think a lot of people. That's probably why they hired him, right? Because they knew like older X-Men geeks would probably come back for that, which we did. And it was pretty good. So, yeah, I was going through the collection of comics. My parents dumped on me um, from just like all the random stuff they're finding in closets and stuff in their house. And there's a crazy amount of Disney comics. I really, really liked Disney comics growing up too. And I guess I didn't realize it until going back through and realizing that those ones uh, I think had more, like I went back through them, I reread them. They made a bigger impression on me than a lot of even like Marvel and Image and all the other Valiant and stuff that came out, little like one shots and stuff. Um, I had a, a good appreciation for them, um, but I really think that those ones were like masterful. And I guess it makes sense too because uh, Will Eisner ended up writing the like the book on how to write comics a long, long time ago, and that's kind of served as an industry standard. Yeah, I was going to say one of the the kid paradoxes you have to work out with the Disney comics, other than like, do I look like a dumb little kid reading them is it's it's difficult to accept that Uncle Scrooge is the best one. You know, when you're an adult, it's like, well, Uncle Scrooge is the best one as a kid. It's like, but shouldn't Mickey Mouse's comic be better? Or Donald Duck or Goofy's comic be better? No, no. Uncle Scrooge has the best comic. Just you need to accept this. Well, yeah, because, yeah, I mean, Mickey's the vehicle. Mickey is this might be a too deep of a of an analogy that's inside my brain, but like Dis Mickey is the Walmart. Like he is the building of Walmart. You know what I mean? Like every, you don't go to Walmart because of the Walmart. You go to the Walmart. If, if that's where you go to go and like buy the things that you want, the things that interest you. Right. And I almost see that like Disney's Mickey is this big shell. Like he's the personified version of Disney because children don't necessarily understand the abstract concept of a global conglomerate. Um, like Cthulhu, like nightmare creature that di what Disney is, but you put a face on it and you see, Hey, anytime you see this head, anytime you see the Mickey ears or Mickey mouse, that means all of Disney, the princesses and the robots and the star Wars, all of that. When you see that mouse. So I almost feel that, that it's never been Mickey's role 
outside of the Steamboat Willie uprising until, you know, he became like a corporation. But I think that that's always been his plan was just to say like, oh, if I see Mickey, whatever I'm looking at is Disney IP essentially, which I guess going into the comic books, I remember it was like Jack and the Beanstalk and Gulliver's Travels and a whole bunch of a more grim st- uh, style fairy tales that they just put their stamp on for that weaponized nostalgia aspect. They did a great job because I swear to you until I die, if anyone ever brings up Gulliver's travels, I'm imagining like Mickey mouse being involved somehow, or if they bring up, um, you know, Jack and the beanstalk, I'm imagining Mickey's in there somehow, like, like Walt Disney wrote those books and use the time well, machine Black's, to bring them back in the past. Jack Black's not the first thing that pops in your mind for Gulliver's travels. Definitely not. No, <laughs> I actually did see that movie once. It was like fifty yen, and my daughter was three, and we're like, "Ah, what the hell? Let's put it on." And I, it actually, it wasn't the worst thing in the world. I've seen much worse movies. A Jack and the Beanstalk that that was much worse, or Jack and the Killer Giant. They renamed it or something. Jack the yeah. Giant Killer. That was it. Yeah, yeah that yeah. one was kind of rough. So, Gulliver's Travels was better than that, I guess. Question mark. Put a question mark on that. Um, well, I mean, I think in the comic book, and then they had like a TV series, like an older one, I think from the 80s or the 90s. Those I remember the, liking that one. Ted Robert. Danson was in that, if I remember. Yes, yeah, that wasn't bad. No, and they really promoted the hell out of that thing beforehand. I remember as a kid, you know, they'd have that TV miniseries of the year that you were like, this is the biggest thing that's ever happened just because they're jamming it on the commercial so much. So the, the stand, uh, Stephen King's stand. TV movie, which I still remember being pretty good. Um, and yeah, yeah, yeah Gulliver's Travels Maybe. might have been the one after the stand. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure how it would work if I watched it now, but I, at the time it was like the best thing ever, right? When, whenever some also, when I saw that movie, um, Tropic Thunder and the Simple Jack character, and they're like, you never go full Simple Jack or whatever. That's all <laughs> I can think of is the guy in the stand where it was like, that's another example of you never go full like stand. <laughs> Right, right. Okay. It's again, last time I saw it was 1990, it came, whenever it came out. So, um, it I read was, the book though and made me read the book. I did read the yeah, book after okay. watching it. Yeah. I, apparently, there's not a lot of good Stephen King adaptations other than The Shining, in my opinion. And which, ironically, uh, that was the one that I guess he hated the most, but it was kind of the best one so there's something to that yeah after the stand came out was quite successful stephen king's like ah here's my shining and it's perfect mini series tv form gross it's so it's It's so not great here's a stephen king approved version of the shining for you stand up to history in my opinion and and it had less resolution than the show lost like (laughs) you get more uh you get like more of a completed feeling after watching lost and you do the stand well, at least Lost, there's that extra bit after the last episode where that at least explains the polar bears to you, right? They did explain the polar bears, in, in, but in ancillary uh, content. But uh, yeah, the black hole, uh, it, have you never seen this one before then? This is your first viewing? First viewing, had no idea. I couldn't really tell necessarily if this was uh, them on the coattails of Star Wars. So hearing that this this had a possibility, there's an alternate dimension that's only a few adjacent from ours in which this came out before star Wars. Is that a possibility you're saying as a disaster movie a year before, but it would have felt like the Poseidon adventure instead in space. Okay. So it would not have been uh lasers and pew pew and like uh lightsaber battles. Like it is in now. Not so much. I mean, just look at Max Milley and not the actor, the robot. I mean that that's Darth Vader, right? I mean, especially in silhouette. Um, you know, a demon or Darth Vader, we can look at both angles because I guess both are valid. But oh man, I'm I'm still trying to picture it. But yeah, I'm I'm so much more disappointed in this movie, hearing how large the aspirations are. But that's another theme that we've uncovered throughout all these episodes is that when Disney really banks on something, I don't know. It's like they put they're trying too hard to put magic into it. Like sometimes you got to just let the magic flow. I think Vincent and Bob were successes. I'm going to give Vincent and Bob oh, successes. Huge. Their merch still sells today. Usually okay. with, you know, old farts who were around to see this movie. But, you know, there are people that love Vincent and, and Bob. I wouldn't have known who the hell they were before. Now, if if I had come across Vincent somewhere or Bob, I would have assumed that it was from like Mega Man 3, like some weird Dr. Wily generic level uh, sort of guy that you have to go against. But Vincent is now in my top 10 Disney characters of all time. He's got the best snark. He's he's very dark sense of humor. 
Um, I just love everything. He's deadly. Like he's an absolute deadly sharpshooter. He will shoot first and ask questions later, but he also looks like a children's toy. There's so many right. cool things. Like he's the most dangerous toy, you know, that you could ever he rips have. the hole into robot Maximilian at the end. Right. Like, <laughs> right. like just he uses brute force to, to end Maximilian. That's, that's pretty intense. Well, I, and I should he's, got, he's got crazy ego. Cause they're uh, all the Android robots that are, or the humanoid robots that are on this ship. Right. They're having, I guess like a duck hunt. Like they're, throw in or shooting these like little plasma discs out and then they'll they'll try and shoot them and stuff and they're always comparing to each other even like like flip their guns around and put them down on their holsters like they're freaking wild west cowboys and uh vincent comes up and just runs it like he he even makes a whole big deal out of it like i'll show this guy he like talks a little bit of smack to him and then he shows everyone that he's the master marksman and then at the end, he even shoots a hole through a dude's chest. Like this is their leader, right? I don't know. That was that was the moment when Vincent goes to jail and he walks up to the biggest guy and just punches him right in the face. Like that's <laughs> what and what a while because he's got like a weird like red smile with these goofy eyes the whole time, floating around on a string. <laughs> yeah, um, the voices are uncredited in the movie, but both of the robot voices need to be mentioned. Uh, Roddy McDowell did Vincent. He was a uh, Cornelius and then Caesar in the Planet of the Apes movies, and uh, Slim Pickens was old Bob. Which I mean, that's that's great, yes. you know, voice casting. <laughs> and and I just want to say too that we made a huge mistake somewhere in our recent past on not making all robots and AI have a like a southern twang, like a hillbilly <laughs> vibe to them. Like we're missing out just because it's so disarming to have this death machine that can just shoot you with lasers at any moment that can uh telepathically communicate with you and i think the implication there is that if vincent were to go bad like he can just wreak havoc he, he could take out everyone on the entire ship but to have someone with that much power talk like this y'all and like have like that southern you know I don't know. There's something so endearing. I wish that that was the real reality that maybe like a drone came outside your house from DARPA, but it like has a folksy accent before it murders you and your family. See, I, I live in Japan, so it's all gone the other direction. I ride Splash Mountain, which we still have here, by the way. And all the robots are now, you know, all the, the racist robots are now speaking Japanese. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's weird with, with Br'er Rabbit speaking Japanese, you know, but uh, that that's what happens. So. <laughs> Do they um, yell? Is there a yelling cadence to it at all? And oh, in Splash Mountain? No, to just when they translate into Japanese. Oh, um, no, 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 I don't think they're yelling or anything. I mean, most I remember when I f first went with my wife there, I convinced her to go on Splash Mountain, and she won't get on a kitty coaster, right? But uh, I didn't really know how coaster phobic she was because we it was shortly after we had met, so we did Splash Mountain, and she was pissed at all the animals on it because she kept saying they kept telling me everything was going to be okay and it wasn't okay because <laughs> she didn't like the drop right so <laughs> actually i'm sorry yeah and i'm now looking i'm like god how did i get her on that thing <laughs> that's the whole ride man the drop is the entire thing right right but in japanese all the animals were telling her that things are going to be okay don't worry you know it's we're going to a laughing place so she's like okay and she's like the animals all lied to me <laughs> Because she was like, oh, once a drop happened, that was the end of the world. It was like uh, Ernest going down. In his That's special. what animals do, man. Just like we talked about what in, in Brother Bear, um, like nature has no morality or ethics. Nature yeah. it just is. So you can't trust nature. Well, let's not talk about the morality and ethics of the characters on Splash Mountain, though. That's always a bad <laughs> time. <laughs> Um, anyway, there is some nice dark stuff here. It, it's more of a sci-fi, but this is where I wanted to start the dark Disney one. Cause like I said, every few years, I'm like, I think I should watch the black hole again. You know, it, it, it does have an allure, especially when it's been a few years since you've seen it. You're like, I remember so much of it being cool. Maybe I'll get it this time. And, and you know, it's just, right. and, again, and I don't pacing. want, I don't want my initial reaction to like, uh, dissuade anyone from watching it. It's a hundred percent worth watching at least once because it, again it has so many great things to it that were amazing to see but just it's just as a movie it doesn't kind of stand up but yeah and it's super dark like i'm a fan of any disney movie that has guns and then there's another uh layer to it where a disney movie where a human being dies is such a rarity that also exists in this one 
Um, they kind of show like dead people that have been re- that's what I say, zombie cool. corpses. Yeah, uh, the yeah. one you see, by the way, the one you see is the director. That's the director cameo. And when he takes the face plate off of the one guy and it's, and you see the, like <laughs> the one day that's, that he showed up for work. Yeah. That's Gary <laughs> Nelson there. So, <laughs> but yeah, real. I mean, when you start thinking about that, cause even 20,000 leagues under a sea, doesn't captain Nemo have like a living crew? <laughs> honestly when when they did that big and you can tell that it's supposed to be this huge reveal at the end like that was supposed to make you i guess you know get out of your seat or something it wasn't that huge of a reveal because they mentioned it way earlier on that all these humanoids that are working were the previous um members of the ship right so we we already knew what the reveal was going to be it was just when they show it if they had shown that earlier and made it so that the entire crew had to know that all these people were like the dead humans and that they were going to kind of be next. It would have put a whole much cooler, like a horror thrill tone to the whole movie just by doing that reveal a little bit earlier. And they could have had Anthony Perkins like completely get converted and he goes psycho on him, you know, <laughs> that would have been a man. See that again, this is like one of those movies where I get, I get like frustrated thinking about everything that it could have been uh, versus what we actually ended up with, but still watch it. Watch yeah. It. Like it's almost like it was like we said, it's almost like this movie was constructed to be a theme park ride because I it was just for my mm-hmm. other podcast. I watched Batman and Robin again, which I've had to watch twice in the past few years for various podcasts. But one thing I was going to say, OK, this looks one that that movie is not CGI. It's all weird, crazy, practical stuff, because now I think when you think back to Batman, Robin, you're like oh, that's a CGI mess. It's well, not. Wasn't um, that also Tim Burton? Nah, Burton was off by the fourth one. This is the okay. fourth of the Batman uh, Warner. Yeah, original. yeah I, I probably don't even keep him. What this which is Batman? The, was this was this Affleck Batman? No, this is Clooney Bat nipples. This is the Bat nipples oh, movie. Oh, okay. This was like probably one of the worst, the worst it's one considered to be them. the worst. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I, I will admit, and I brought it to a podcast five years ago or so um, as a bad movie. Like I think this is one of the worst movies ever, but. I've re- watched it a few and it, I'm kind of warming up to it. You know, that one I do like better each time I watch it in part. Cause now we have like plenty of other Batman. So if I want to see dark gritty Batman, you know, I go watch the Batman from a few years ago, you know, if I want that. So now, but so when I saw Batman Robin opening night in the theater, my friend, I was like, what the hell are we watching? This is, <laughs> this is currently Batman. This is Batman. Right. <laughs> so everyone was pissed off where, you know, now we have like 20 other movies. You like, you couldn't figure out which one I was talking about, you know? So it, it's kind of fun to watch now. It's a, not quite as fun as watching the 60 series, but not far off. And Arnold Schwarzenegger in that one is just, he's magical. Uh, he, I guess. Puts, I mean, I, you've seen it more recently than I have because I think the last time I saw it was when it first came out too, and I was like, "This is garbage." I don't. I'm, I'm Batman's dead now. Like they yeah. killed Batman for me. But <laughs> in if you were to watch it again recently, is it self aware like '60s Batman? Is it is it like self aware Adam West? Because Adam, you can never convince me that Adam West wasn't always self aware of exactly how cheesy the whole thing. Like they leaned into the cheese and they made that part of like the endearing qualities of it right but the Clooney batman felt like they were taking it seriously and only after the fact they might have pretended like oh no, no no we knew it was cheesy they knew it was cheesy i mean the movie opens with a dramatic thing of batman robin coming into the bat cave you get crotch shots of them you get nipple shots and, and then they're running towards the batmobile and then robin's just like i want to drive the car this time you know like record scratch and then Clooney is like I should work, you know, this is why Superman works alone. You know, I'm like, that, that's cheese ball. Schwarzenegger, he gives a few puns, ice puns. He actually stops the ice puns pretty quickly. It's just now he delivers all of his lines like he's delivering a pun. <laughs> Even Time though it's not freeze. a pun. Yep. Right, no, no, after that, it's just like, I will send you. To hell, you know, it's like not even a pun anymore, but he's still delivering it like it's a pun. Well, yeah, because all he had to say was hasta la vista, baby, one time. And he's like, oh, I can just put any three words together and it turns into a T-shirt. Yeah. So that's the weird thing uh, in the black hole. It's a better movie, but it's less rewatchable. <laughs> and dude, the black hole has so many quotable lines in it. I was just I was making notes the entire movie on all these great quotes that I was seeing pop up left and right. Uh, now I have to scan if I, I did any quotes. Looks like I did not actually. I mean, I mean uh, Maximilian Chanel, I'm sure you could write down most of his dialogue and have some fantastic quotes. Uh, Dr. Hans Reinhardt. I guess I should use the character's name since there is also a character named Maximilian. 
that's what makes th- this is one of the more confusing movies to do a podcast on because of that. The other one is uh, the thing because you keep saying the thing is, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, I've still. I mean, I don't even know if I should admit this. I don't think I've ever actually seen the thing. I had not the seen new the thing until the I. One. I had not seen the thing until I did a podcast for it uh, again uh, three or four years ago. Um, because the reason you might have not seen the thing is because when it came out, it was considered to be a absolute piece of trash. Like it just everyone's like, "This is a crappy movie. No one should watch it." And it and. It got re-released on DVD. It was one of the first DVD releases in like 98, 99. And then in a special edition, first big special edition. That's when people started to look back and say, this movie's really good. And it is. Uh, when I saw a thing that it might be the best Carpenter. And and, and I like a lot of Carpenter wow. movies. So that's not someone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's in the con, it's a contender. So I will actually recommend that while we're in October, you give the thing of you. You don't need to watch the 1951 and the um 2012 one uh i'm waiting apparently they shot that one with practical effects and then the execs were like no put some cgi crap all over it so i'm hoping we'll eventually see a, a version where <laughs> someone just takes the cgi off <laughs> <laughs> once with the south park turns like put a lady in it and make it lame it's like put some cgi in it and <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 so um i have not seen the newer one which apparently isn't bad but i'm like i want to see it with practical effects it's kind of like how i don't want to see cats until someone makes the butthole cut <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i don't don't even get me started on the cat's tangent because we'll be here for a while so <laughs> i feel like there's one thing that i really have to uh put out there for the rest of my notes to start making sense and that's that they kind of beat you over the head in the beginning of this movie as it's starting out that this is a retelling of Dante's Inferno. Like this movie is Dante's Inferno. They they say they talk Dante's Inferno in the first few minutes as they're amongst themselves. They refer to the black hole as hell. Um, even Maximilian has like a red uh, like bodysuit, and then like everything about that they they have a whole bunch of biblical style quotes. There's one quote in particular that I guess needed that preface. And I think that they're talking to Alex, who is uh, Anthony Perkins. And he asks him, like, what are you after, Alex? Immortality? And he he responds something like, no, scientific truth. But I think what they were doing here, because it's in a sci-fi setting and it's not taking place in the 14th century, that um, the version of, I guess, immortality is scientific truth. Like, if, if you can if you can disprove God or if you can find like the ultimate science that would allow you to travel through a black hole and even turn into a robot or fuse into like some inorganic being that could potentially live forever, that that's sort of no different than uh, just complete damnation as it would be in the 14th century. Because maybe in the 14th century, they didn't have the same concepts as merging with a robot body and traveling through a black hole into a different dimension where time doesn't have to exist yeah and they're they're like accusing him of like you've spent all the you talk people into spending all this money on this mission i'm like man if i can talk the military industrial complex into costly fiascos that's great <laughs> what well, and again dude if, if this were in the lens of dante's inferno that was that's what gluttony and greed kind of all in the the same um breath and the the biggest one is that as soon as you enter the the what was it called the Cyrus um, the, ship yeah yeah or the the Cy, Cygnus Cygnus is that it the I'll, Cygnus I'll give, give you so when they enter into the Cygnus the very first thing they see are all these ghost like creatures these are those humanoids that were basically the previous humans from the ship originally and Reinhardt claims that they would have been long gone they would have all died if he hadn't done this. Who knows what kind of necromancy that he used, but he reanimated all of these near dead humans into these mindless slaves that are just doing his like the most boring of all work on the entire ship. And these are this is basically the shades of the dead. That's something like the, the top layer of hell. I think the first level of hell in Dante's Inferno are these shades of dead, which are like these ghost like creatures that are just there to kind of be administrative you know workers and i mean again it, it feels like they were beating me over the head like this is dante's inferno this is dante's inferno everything about it i want to go back outside of the cygnus for a minute though because it, it's a, 
one of the most mm-hmm. amazing and bizarre spaceships I think we've seen in like a major movie. Like it looks like a crystal palace from like a, you know, 19th century world's fair or something. Uh, my note was 1980 and 1983, 1893 Chicago world's fair. But I think, I think maybe London had the crystal palace or Paris or something. Maybe a little bit of that. I also, it made me feel like I was just walking through um, somewhere in New York city that was under construction. They just had all of like, uh, the staging up for it, it kind of just had that like an industrial feel, like like there was someone was building a skyscraper in the sky and they hadn't quite finished it yet. Lights off, yeah. Once they turn the lights on, it has Fair. this really like kind of Victorian r- Rococo look to it. Rococo's a different time period, but whatever. It just yeah, it's a very specific design. So that just made me think, uh, you know, why that design. Other than it does look cool, but it's it's where do you land on that? You know, I mean, I mean, I guess that that I'll have to agree with um, uh, what was his name, Tyson, the 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 round Earth guy <laughs> that said that this was the least scientifically accurate. But I guess I have to agree with him on that one too because this ship seems like it was the least. And I know you don't necessarily need aerodynamics uh, in space. I understand that, but it feels like it was so impractical. Uh, in the construction of this and this huge ship. So that part didn't make sense. Neil deGrasse Tyson. And the only, the other thing too, that as soon as you said that made me think as soon as they show you're on a ship, right? You're on the Cygnus and you look out the, like the front window of the Cygnus and it's like, Oh look, there's the black hole off in the distance. It seems that if you ever were to get close enough to see a black hole with your naked eyes, you're in the black hole. Like it's because it absorbs all light. Right. So, I mean, if, if I can look at you and you can see me, then that means there's light, but if there's also black hole, then you can, what's bound is there light bouncing off the black hole, letting you see into it. It just seems like it's instant death. The second that you're like, Oh, there's a black, and then, you're, and then that's it. You're gone. Well, that was the whole thing with the uh, interstellar. It's like, Oh, we got, um, I forget the physicist Kip Thorne or something, uh, the physicist uh, that worked on that to like, try and design what a black hole would actually look like. And people I know that don't like that movie basically don't like it because he breaches the event horizon and ends up in, you know, love is gravity, all that sort of stuff. So have you seen interstellar? I like it. Yeah. Matthew oh, I love interstellar. Yeah. I'm not one of the haters, but people I know that like are, like on, I, I mean, nobody is going to tell you it's a, a wreck of a production or anything, but they, I know people that specifically hate the ending of that movie. Whereas I like it, I like it. And now, if maybe AI will let us do this in the next 10 years, there's a possibility. But if you could blend Black Hole with Interstellar, there is a better movie than Interstellar that could come out of that concoction. Well, that could come out in the next 10 years. Again, the remake was at least being thought about and got scuttled because of interstellar. So we're getting to the point now where there's enough distance. You could do it. And um, yeah, hey, man, that was a lot of hype building up. And if yeah. Disney says it's going to be one of their A movies and it's not going to be one of their A movies, it's like a whole thing. Well, it's like how there's supposed to have been a Logan's run remake for 25 years running now, you know, so don't hold your breath. <laughs> yeah. As soon as the new Duke Nukem comes out. Yep. 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 <laughs> Um, Chinese democracy, what are the other long holdouts? <laughs> the day it was worth the wait, though. Everyone, everyone agrees. Every, yes, yes, it's a masterpiece of, of all. So time. I, I got a couple of my other quotes. So that was um, one of the quotes that I really liked. Um, uh, one of the times someone blurts out the classical Machiavellian, and I think it's Reinhardt, and justifies the means, which uh, I know two centuries separated from Dante, but it, it has that same kind of feel. Like he's essentially invoking these uh luciferian sort of principles to let you know that he's the ultimate bad guy he's challenging god he's challenging um everything about nature he's a necromancer he's a traitor he's lying to the government um like he he's the ultimate big baddie in this movie for so many different reasons um and then uh there's another phrase it was they say pay the piper and then I had to look up this because I rem- I know Pied- we talked about Pied Piper and pay the Piper. I've always heard as being related to the Pied Piper. And that was how they had to pay him because if he plays the music, then you got to pay afterwards. But I, I was looking up because I wasn't sure where this exact phrase came from that they use in the black hole. And there's an, another version that says, if one dances, one must pay the Piper. That's the the bad version. But then there's another one that says, he who pays the Piper calls the tune. 
And this threw me for like a whole little mini tangent rabbit hole, but it's like, is paying the piper good or bad? Because in one of those instances, paying the piper means that you're going to have your comeuppance, right? You're going to reap what you sow, or you're going to have to pay a cost for something eventually. But the other one is almost implying that, well, if you're the one paying the piper, you get to decide the tune that you have the upper hand in that case. I don't know. I knew it was a total tangent, but this movie threw me down that. Well, yeah, in Jungle Book too. that's where you're talking about Pipers, because he's piping folks out of the village um, with his Disney song, which this doesn't this doesn't have the cute song to for the Piper to play. This has a death is their only release. That, that's oh, what I wrote. As, it. Yeah, you that's what it, it. That's I said. That seems like a magical <laughs> Disney movie concept. That's right <laughs> after Vincent straight up murders a dude. And right after we see the weird black mass funeral, which seems to be like the dark, chewy center of this movie, I guess. Uh, right, other but, than but the last we, shot. And what you're missing in that too, that you won't get from any audio rendition of it. But when this is Vincent talking and Vincent's like, death is their only release. Like it's the, it's the weirdest out of like nowhere almost, but also Ernest Borgnine's in the shot. And then you've got his go- Vincent's goofy red face with the big eye. Like it's a cartoon character. It's a silly, funny 1970s children's show cartoon character. It's in a Disney movie saying death is their only release. My fa- one of my favorite Disney quotes of all time by far. Um, and there's another one too. And this one I had to st- I had to like start doing a bunch of research. I had to hit pause and everything. Um, and one of the guys said, I can't remember who played this particular character, but they're talking to Vincent and he says, remember what they say, all work and no play. And this is when they bring Vincent to where all of the other androids on the ship are doing their duck hunt style target practice. And he's kind of like, nah, I don't want to play with the other kids. You know, he's kind of an introvert or he's like, he only wants to hang out with Bob. He doesn't want to play with the, the, the new kids in this part of town. And he's telling them like, you know, go play, go, go do this. So he says, remember what they say, all work and no play. And Vincent responds, all such, um, all sunshine makes a desert, so the Arabs say, which is the best response to that particular phrase, right? Because it's like, you just want to play all the time. But this movie came out a year before The Shining, so this actually uses that phrase. And I know they didn't invent it. I know it's been used plenty of other times before. But remember all work and no play in this weird dystopian sort of surreal horror movie, which I would count this movie as predating The Shining using it. I doubt that Kubrick saw the black hole and was like, Oh, I've got, I've got to put it in my movie. Uh, but it's an interesting synchro mystic connection between the two. Um, I do want to move back to the weird black mass funeral. I, Cause I, I wonder if you have a note on that. Cause I'm like watching and being like, something's here and I'm missing it. Uh, did, did you have a take on that? I, I mean, I saw it happen and I also saw that they saw, who was it? Was it Anthony Perkins that ends up seeing one of the guys sees them doing this weird black mass ritual and they even make a note that, oh, wow, this this almost looked like a send off of a human that looked like a funeral and that they were all there to watch it. And then Maximilian shows up and he scares the guy away. It might have been Ernest Borgen. And he was like, yeah, yeah. oh, I I, I didn't think it was see Forrester this, or... and Charlie. Yeah, because uh, Perkins and Alex is basically with Max uh, with with. Uh, Reinhardt the whole time. I keep wanting to call him Max really because that's his actor's name. <laughs> this, I, unless I am missing something really obvious, which could be possible, it almost feels like this got this got like blurred a little bit in the cutting room floor or all the different rewrites or something. Uh, but yeah, this was probably the most occult scene in the entire movie, and I'm not like, sure exactly what to make out of it. You know what? Probably because I'm watching, I'm thinking of like, you know, Eyes Wide Shut or something. Because you just, the organization, the dark lighting, you know, no faces, that sort of thing. Not not well, so they, many. They look like evil cult members. Out. They're all these brainless zombies that are basically reanimated, dead, cybernetic creature slaves, right? Like that is what they're doing. But they take time out of their day to do these weird send offs out into space. Who died? Why did he get the send off? Does everyone get the send off? I was Isn't also everybody meeting, dead. <laughs> well, and I, was, I was wondering too that how come Vincent and Bob, when they killed some of the androids, they didn't stuff those androids in the black mass hole and just like sent them out into space? Maybe it would have been too obvious. I don't know. Yeah, it is like you know, like Dawn of the Dead. Why are they at the mall? That's just what they remember from being alive. So it's like, what? How, how dead are they? You know. <laughs> 
Well, and are they alive at all? Uh, did they die for? Because I don't know if you can take Reinhardt as a reliable narrator. He's clearly shown that he is uh, not a person that you can trust. He even at the very beginning they establish him as being this sort of unreliable person because they make this note of, "Oh, didn't you get our communications?" And he's like, "Oh yeah, of course I did." Oh, did you did you want me to respond? And <laughs> like. Uh, yeah, yeah, guy. Like we kind of were expecting you to respond a while ago because you've been, you know, took off with uh, the the biggest financial endeavor that like military's ever taken. Uh, maybe this ship was supposed to be a metaphor for the production of this movie. Yeah, well, uh, it's full of hot air, right? Because if you're making a spaceship for deep space travel, why would you have large carnivorous corridors and things that you have to? you know, pump air into and heat and have artificial gravity for, you know, because they do make a point of the gravity because in, in their ship, the uh, the name I keep forgetting, but not Prospero, but something along those lines. Uh, pa Palomino. There we go. Palomino. The Palomino, they don't have good zero G effects, but it's supposed to be zero G <laughs> in the Palomino. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and they make a point. OK, when we get to the Cygnus, there is artificial gravity. So. Yeah, when, when they're on the Palomino and they're trying to show some of the zero gravity, it just looks like a toddler in like a jungle gym a little bit. They're like jumping over tables and stuff. Also, I I couldn't not see this the entire movie. And again, when you tell me big budget competing with Star Wars, but I could see the damn string that they were using to pull Vincent around on almost half of the shots. And you can almost just see them him moving around it's just like someone pulling around on a string there's nothing really complicated it seems about any of like the mechanics there's no real animatronics at least to that even all of the robots they're just dudes in suits kind of moving around and even when they move around they don't walk in unison you tell me they couldn't have reshot a few of these scenes where they're all going down a hall but like one of the dudes is clearly walking in like a slightly different cadence and step as everybody else i don't know there's so many weird little uh, things like that. Maybe this was just part of being movies in the 70s. I'll have to say that I'm also have never been a huge fan of the legit Star Wars either for a lot of these same reasons. I, I tend to like it when people are like, oh no, my, my Star Wars is uh, Star Tours, right? Which kind of is the black hole in a spirit in a way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am looking up just some stuff on Cygnus. and I, Maybe you have some notes on the use of that name for the ship. Uh, it's what in the Northern Cross? Deneb is there. I was like talking about Deneb. Um, I, I guess we haven't done much uh, star stuff in, in this particular podcast, but well, so I've got a whole bunch of notes all linking this movie. I guess in more specific ways to Dante's Inferno. Uh, I didn't reread Dante's Inferno in prep for this. I have read it in the past, but uh, I That's do. Where I am. I knew I knew a few of these things were just like standing out to me, and because they say it, and because uh, Reinhardt is, is essentially this like Luciferian figure that is trying to achieve immortality, maybe in hubris, but also like almost in a physical way. And I guess at the end, spoiler alert, he fuses together with Maximilian, and he kind of becomes Reinhardt slash Maximilian. Like he himself becomes a robot, but it's not this necromantic humanoid robot it's like an actual robot with consciousness did i get that right um like a high functioning like ai i guess because he's definitely making a few of his own decisions um oh by the way before we leave this the star thing here we go just just for a, a somewhat satisfying answer to my question i just found the constellation cygnus is home to cygnus x1 a distant x-ray binary containing a supergiant an unseen massive companion that was the first object widely held to be a black hole it was discovered in 1964 i think that pretty much answers the ship name question B black hole related it's like the first black hole they found. Th thought they found. So obviously, uh, making this movie, if you know that would be an obvious name for the ship. So um, in Dante's Inferno, they basically have these demons that guard um, all the different circles of hell, right? Maximilian and all of the other, I guess, storm trooper type characters. You can call them that. <laughs> That's they what they are, have, isn't it? Well, they're they're demonic red stormtroopers. They look a little bit more evil. They're literally red. And um, again, I guess there's a little bit 
of a creepier aspect to them because they don't look perfect. They're not like perfectly in unison and they're not bumbling the same way. They've got way better accuracy. In fact, when they do the little target practice, I think I only see one of them miss one shot versus stormtroopers where you're like, don't worry. Like we don't even have to really run or duck. If they're shooting at you, you just kind of like keep walking in a straight line and there's a better chance that they won't hit you anyways. But, but Maximilian and the rest of those, those androids, I guess, are these demonic um, gatekeepers. And I, I guess this is worth pointing out, too. If no one's ever seen this movie, it might be a little bit confusing because there's at least three or four different types of robots slash humanoid things on this, right? So there's yeah. Bob and Vincent, who are technically two different models, but they might as well be like the same kind of model. And there's sort your of your R2D2, your Astromech. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is your R2D2, maybe even C3PO kind of combined into like this one thing that looks like a Dr. Wily invention from one of the early levels of Mega Man. That's one type of robot. Then you've got these humanoid shade, like cult like things. Those are the ones that were sending um, people off into the Black Mass. Some actually, maybe that Black Mass was showing that they do have something human about them still. I couldn't imagine the non humanoids doing this, but I also don't know why that would have been like a secret thing. I don't, I guess if I'm, I'm, I'm figuring out as we talk here, right? So the reason that he wasn't supposed to see that send off is because you're not supposed to know as one of these crew members that those are humanoids. That's the big reveal at the end, you know, it as the viewer, but the characters don't know that until the end when they pull one of the helmets off. So that's just another hint of like, oh, they do have some kind of humanity left. And that humanity takes the form of a funeral procession, I guess. Maybe that's how they're escaping the ship. They have just enough sentience to realize they don't want to be there and are slowly drifting themselves out into the black hole. Death is their only release. Right. They need the second death. In that case, why don't they all just line up and just pop themselves into that little death hole and just take themselves out, right? Yeah. Well, maybe, so, I mean, again, they are sort of zombies, so they're probably not thinking 100% rationally about how to do this, you know? So, okay, so you've got Vincent and Bob are the cartoony, like, straight-up R2-D2 robots. You've got these weird zombie, cult, humanoid, necromantic sort of robots, which are just there to, like, do computer work. Uh, they're, I don't know, they, they have, like, menial jobs. Then you've got Maximilian, who's, like, the super death robot. He's kind of a one-of-a-kind. Darth Vader, I great. I guess that's a good analogy for him. Uh, he doesn't have the charm, but he definitely has the silhouette. And then you've got two different types of stormtroopers. You've got sort of a, a red stormtrooper, and you've got a black stormtrooper. And the black stormtrooper is like the team leader, and he's the one that gets shot by Vincent and gets a hole through his chest just because Vincent's like showing off. They weren't even fighting. He was just like, and just shoots through his chest. I don't know. It's, it was such an alpha move. One of my favorite scenes in any Disney movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, maybe George Lucas ripped it off a bit because he he put red stormtroopers into the later movies, right? Return of the Jedi. Yeah, I was going to say, I guess I guess um, Reinhardt is basically our emperor, which also was not yet in Star Wars. Only mentioned in the first one, I believe. The first Star Wars. That's I meant of that. that. <laughs> well, Reinhardt is Emperor and Darth Vader in one, right? Because Maximilian uh, doesn't really speak at all for himself. He's just a, a machine that... Um, Reinhardt's got to chew the right? scenery for Maximilian, I guess. Right, yeah, right. Like, <laughs> Reinhardt is is the master of him. Um, where And uh, still, even now, Vincent is way more hardcore and way cooler and way scarier than any of the other robots that Reinhardt had. Because even Reinhardt didn't realize that um that they could have this this telepathic communication he makes a note of it he's like oh that's right i forgot that you've got a telepathic link with this robot and they don't really explain exactly how that technology works either because it almost seems like it's only dr kate that uh can have this mental connection I don't know. Did I did I miss something, or did they just kind of throw it out there? Yeah, it's a weird sci-fi thing. Actually, Star Trek did it a bit. Uh, the the first episode was William Shatner, like they fly into something in space, and there's a couple people that have a little bit of ESP ability, so they their powers get bumped up and they become gods, basically, um, which is not what happens here. But yeah, the idea that some people have a little more ESP than others, which I guess that's a real thing, you know. Um, is it? 
I don't know. I have an ESP trainer on my phone. I don't have ESP. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I've learned from that. <laughs> well, I guess they don't make it really clear, but it's it was my impression that the ESP was essentially coming from Vincent because it was like, oh, I forgot that you know that this robot can do this thing, but they only show Kate doing it. So maybe you're right. Maybe Kate is really the one that has a little bit of the shining. And because of that, the Vincent can talk to her more directly, but I don't know. It's again, it just, it makes Vincent seem like a superior, like he is way overpowered compared to anything else. They put him up against in this movie or Kate got the Neuralink. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's part of it. Maybe she actually does have the Neuralink. She's also playing spider solitaire in her head the entire movie. <laughs> well, I mean, if anything, this is a glowing review of the Neuralink because that telepathic connection is sort of what saves everyone in this movie. That's what uh, lets them know ahead of time that Reinhardt is gone kind of or he's been evil. I guess you, you kind of had to see that one coming from like a million miles away, too, though, right? Yeah, but you can see where it take it would take Anthony Perkins a while to figure it out, you know? <laughs> I don't, I mean, I don't know, man, because it's the second they show up, if, because I'm assuming they're in the military, right? Whatever, what, however they got into space, it's some iteration branch of the military in some capacity because they're there on official government means. And as soon as they show up, they all kind of acknowledge, yeah, Reinhardt, you've gone rogue. And he acknowledges, like, no, I'm not, I'm disobeying direct orders. The order was for me to return to Earth. I'm not doing it. My work is too much, you know, it's way more important than anything that they're going to recall me for. So I'm just going to do my thing. And Anthony Perkins is like, let's hear him out, guys. But it's like, you mm -hmm. have now also turned yourself into uh, an enemy combatant of the United States by just and saying, let's hear him out. Harry, uh, Borgnine's character seems to be uh, a reporter. Like he's not military, it seems, or he's embedded or something. I, I just, I, I didn't Good quite point, work yeah. out yeah, what he's he like is. a journalist or something. Yeah, it's um, not super clear. It doesn't really matter if he's a journalist or uh, part of the military. It doesn't it matter. It matters. Like it blows up real good. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it's so inconsequential. Whatever, whatever their actual roles were here. Uh, Kate was played by Doctor Kate was played by, and I haven't said her name because I don't know how. Yvette Mimi. I don't know. Y v e t t e m i m i e u x. I don't know how to say that name. Uh, she was in the Time Machine, the 1961. So, oh, um, okay. Main yeah. character was she the was she the lady that he Dr. Falls Kate, in love with? Dr. Kate, um, right? Or yeah, with, oh, oh in the time machine, in the time machine. Yeah, yeah. She was she was like twenty years old when she did that movie. She, okay. she was a little hottie. Yeah. Um, but this is funny. It's talking about um, Nelson. I'm reading from Wiki now. Nelson initially considered casting Sigourney Weaver in the role of Kate McRae, but the head of the casting department balked at the actress's unusual name and rejected her. So. She had to go do like Alien instead. Oh well. What was, it, what was the <laughs> casting director's name? Now I want to know. <laughs> oh, I don't know. This is Nelson. Just be like Bob Smith or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this this is funny. Um, Jennifer O'Neill was originally cast in this role as Doctor Kate, and she'd been told she needed to cut her hair because it would look easier to mm -hmm. film the zero gravity scenes, which whatever. Initially hesitant, she eventually agreed and brought her personal hairstylist, <laughs> by also soon to the studio. O'Neill consumed multiple glasses of wine during the haircut and then left the studio noticeably inebriated and was subsequently hospitalized following a car crash, which cost her the role. So um, oh, you oh. bet, or however you say her name was, uh, like last second casting. But that's not <laughs> drinking at your your first, <laughs> just getting shit faced and crashing your car. It's like, OK, it that's was a, a different time or maybe not. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if that were still kind of going on. Yeah, yeah, the four martini lunch, right? <laughs> uh, also notable scene in here that Vincent saves Bob. Bob is sort of the outdated version of whatever Vincent is, but he's also completely uh, like he's halfway destroyed. Like if, if he was a car and the insurance showed up, they'd be like, yeah, this is a full. <laughs> this is like a full damage. There's no way that we can repair this guy, but somehow he's still alive. Um, but Vincent saves him at the very end, which I thought was kind of interesting. Well, does he at the very end? Doesn't he just say go without me at the end and he does it or something? Uh, there's so much happening at the end, wasn't there? He's like, he's like falling or he gets thrown off of something and uh, Vincent flies down and he saves him from smashing down below. 
uh, oh, okay. at the very first time. And and another really interesting dynamic too is that as soon as they show up on the ship, with no great explanation, but uh, Maximilian, I, th- I think it was Maximilian, he just straight up like pushes Bob off of a table, like Bob's on a table or something. And Maximilian just sticks his little robot arm out and just clears him off the table like he's absolute trash. Well, Bob's a serial abuse victim, right? On this ship. Right. Like, this has been <laughs> happening for years. <laughs> yeah, and even, a- even when they uh, he goes and he tries to do the duck hunt game with the rest of the robots, and they, like, knock him. They push him as he's trying to shoot. And Vincent asks him, he's like, man, you would have had that if, they, if he hadn't have pushed you. And he's like, no, I meant to miss. And there almost seems like there's a whole story there, too. Like, oh, no, if you actually beat them, then they beat you, like, literally. Right. Which That that gives Vincent his motivation for blasting the lead, right? Right. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, "Eh, I won, and uh, now you're done, you know? No one puts Um, baby in the corner. I I guess that's another interstellar parallel, though, because cars, uh, TARS and CASE are a little, obviously, the robots are very different, but the vibe's a little bit similar between the two. Um, especially when the, the two robots are like talking to each other. Um, I don't know. I guess take me to the next level of hell, man. <laughs> uh, well, I, I didn't have all eight of them, but I've got the different representations here. So we've got Reinhardt is obviously Lucifer. He's the, the one at the, the heart of all of it. And I guess him flying into the black hole and getting combined as AI into this like metal suit that sort of Lucifer getting trapped inside of a like a prison of ice. Yeah, it's about say should be an uh, icy hell, hell shouldn't right? it? I mean, yeah, it well, looks way is. cooler. This looks much cooler. This looks like a metal album cover, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see what else. Uh, Vincent is Virgil. So in, in Dante's Inferno, you've got like your escort that leads you around. That's kind of Vincent. Vincent is the one that ends up leading them around the ship. Uh, which I guess is kind of like a proxy to the actual hell, which would be the black hole itself. Um, another thing too was I was I was revisiting the different levels of hell in Dante's Inferno, and I know this is like the most academic subject that gets discussed all the time, but it was just throwing me off, and or it used to at least of why would things like treachery and um, what is it like? being a traitor to someone and fraud. I think fraud and treachery were the, uh, the, the harshest levels of hell over violence. And I was just wondering why would violence be less than fraud? Like if I, if I was like, gave you a fake 20, right. And that was all I ever did to you versus I walked up to you and I punched you or I broke your arm or I broke your finger or something. Those technically you wouldn't go to, as harsh of a level as hell as if I had just slipped you a fake 20. And why is that? And that's because um, Dante's Inferno, and I guess the whole premise of this movie is that Dante's Inferno is not necessarily about individual sin. It's not about the things that you are doing at a personal level and offending God. It's things that you do that are harming society, which is also why heresy is higher on the list than so many of like the other sins. And this explains... Why treachery and fraud? Because treachery and fraud they harm society, uh, while violence only harms a person usually. Yeah, the book was meant and great, especially the Inferno part was kind of meant to be political commentary. You know, he's putting his political enemies in hell. So, you know, one guy murders a guy versus the guy that lied to you and you're pissed at him. You're going to put that guy lower. When I read it in high school, I, we only had to read the Inferno, but I had a well footnoted version that I explained to all these people were. And then I went and I read the Purgatorio as well, because that's also a very good read. Then I started the Paradiso and I uh, gave up about 15 pages in because it was boring. So heaven was boring. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't a lot of other options in the 14th century. What do you want? Yeah, yeah. But, well, well, the first two are great. Yeah. So uh, I did find, you know, the it's it's that third trilogy, you know, sequel disappointment thing I, from the I 14th century. I think if century. they had leaned in harder... If they really, really made this Dante's Inferno in space, it would have been better than what what ended up being. But going to the black hole at the end, again, this is where obviously science completely breaks down because a dying Reinhardt is somehow transported into being fused with Maximilian on on a hellish mountain. That doesn't make sense. Everyone else flies through like a crystal, you know, cathedral, space cathedral, you know, which is 
that's weird. I mean, cool, cool effects for sure. Well, again, but if you consider that this is a actual retelling of Dante's Inferno, that him being encapsulated in that robot body is Lucifer being uh, encased in a, an ice prison, and then everyone else gets to escape because they've kind of, it's kind of been the um, uh, the the ghost of like Midnight's Past or whatever. You know, this is kind of the Ebenezer uh, aspect of it, where they've gone through the different layers, they've seen the moral they've gotten um sort of the lesson that they needed at the end so then they can go back out into the real world although it does even that crystal palace and they, they keep doing these weird like um quick cut shots and like close up on their eyes and light and sort of a very cerebral element to it it if you told me the interstellar was like yeah we took inspiration from the black hole scene from black hole i would actually believe that because there's a little bit of glimpses of that in there Oh yeah, if you're, I mean, you can don't take the science, but take the filmmaking. Uh, you can do that for sure. Um, yeah, I, was, I guess they're in purgatory. Then at the end of the movie, they're not in heaven. They don't know where they are. Uh, that comic book that ran for four issues that continued the story by having them. Well, we're explorers. I guess it's time for us to find a new world. You know, because uh, they've been blasted out into the middle of of nowhere. I just finished doing a, a rundown of the entire Space 1999 series which has a 19... Th now, this is something made between the seasons of Space 1999. As a pilot, it might have been a completely new show. has a few of the same actors, has the same production people. It's called The Day After Tomorrow, Into Infinity. Uh, you can watch it on YouTube, and it's, it's fascinating. It's showing a... Kind of like the crew of the... God, I can never remember the name of the ship. Uh, uh, what is the name of the ship? Palomino. Why can't I remember Palomino? I don't know. It's like the, if the crew of the Palomino never encountered the Cygnus and they went through the black hole at the end anyway. So the Sirius is going to be on the other side. What do they do on the other side of the black hole? But it was one of the, it was a TV show that was made basically um, like it was supposed to teach people about relativity, but the people making the show didn't understand relativity. So it didn't quite work out, but it's, it's kind of sort of trying to be scientifically accurate in that case. God, even the names to things too, though, like Cygnus versus the Death Star. Like, come on, man. There's no <laughs> comparison here. Luke Skywalker versus who the ever the people are in this movie, you know? <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> Harry, what Harry Booth? Was that his name? Sure. I remembered it. Harry it Booth. It doesn't even matter. <laughs> Alex Durant, Dan Holland, Han Solo. Yeah, they dropped a ball there, didn't they? I mean, even Star Trek had that going. Captain Kirk, Spock, That's that's that, that pops a little more. And the only reason that I even remember Reinhardt so well is because I'm using a mnemonic device where I see him wearing a rhinestone uh, cowboy jacket whenever I say his name. So I can't not see him wearing like a devilish rhinestone jacket. So that's how I'm remembering Reinhardt. But even that doesn't have the same gravitas as like Darth freaking Vader. Versus Max Melian. <laughs> Uh, the Max and, Million sounds like a rich kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Vincent's fine. You know, I, we got the Pulp Fiction retro uh, fix for that name, I guess. Vin, dude, Vincent and Bob are totally fine. I was also <laughs> thinking like Bob and then like Microsoft Bob. Like maybe that's what happened to Bob. He turned into Microsoft Bob. Let's see. Vital information necessary centralized labor force. They add the LF to Vincent. So it's actually Vincent LF396. Okay. Hmm. But I, the, I mean, love a freaking Vincent C3PO. movie. Could you imagine <laughs> uh, of just a straight up Vincent movie? Like, where did Vincent come from? You know how Disney likes to do all the reboots, and they'll be like, "Here's where Cruella Deville came from." Yeah, but that it's gonna be, be like the awesome. Buzz Lightyear movie. Who wants that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No one wants wants the Buzz Lightyear version of that. <laughs> that one could have been good too, but it just wasn't. Well, anything could have been good if you did it right. Hey. <laughs> I don't know. Some some things are kind of doomed to fail. Uh, the Cats musical, for example. <laughs> I'm going to have to watch that in a year or two for my bad film podcast. So I, I tried. I can't even get through the movie. There was It was probably the first or the second musical number, and they start singing a word that I had never heard before. Uh, <laughs> like It was Majestical Cats, and then uh, it was something Mary like Poppins that. Mary Poppins did that, too. Genetical Cats, Majestical Cats, like just making words up. And I swear my, like I started getting a migraine and I've, I don't really get migraines for any reason. And I started actually hurting. My head was, <laughs> was 
letting me know, you know, listen to your body. Something in my body was like, I'm being harmed right now. Whatever you're doing, stop it. So I stopped it. No, somewhere around 1999, some family friends gave us tickets for cats in Atlanta. And I, my dad and I are sitting there like, what the hell is going on? So, of course, we had to sit there watch the whole thing. That was the musical version, which I guess people generally like better. Problem with there is there's no story whatsoever, right? It really is just a bunch of songs, like kind of loosely threaded together. So in that case, the Black Hole is a masterpiece of a script because there is a beginning, middle, and an end, even if the middle drags a bit. And the beginning drags it ends pretty cool. If you find yourself comparing and being like, well, at least it's not as bad as cats. Like, I don't know. You've lost the thread <laughs> a little bit, right? Um, let's see. Cats on, on my list of, of good and bad movies. Let's see what, what number it is on the, on the list. It seems to be, uh, I don't have it specifically numbered. It seems to, uh, it seems to be about 30 on the bad number 30 on the bad list so according to that there are definitely 29 worse movies <laughs> well if i can roughly paraphrase doug stanhope uh the cat cats suck doesn't make black hole suck any less suck <laughs> sure okay that works <laughs> But this movie sucks so good that sounds so bad okay <laughs> um, i mean it's a black hole we, but, um, we did we did make it through the black hole, um, but uh, I just want to check in and make sure that you didn't have any other big points in your notes there. No, I'm I'm glad that we watched it. I didn't even know that this movie existed. Star-studded cast, amazing <laughs> concepts, awesome practical effects, aside from the, the really horrible robots, in my opinion, but the humanoid dudes, so creepy, so cool. The little funeral procession, so cool. So many reasons to watch this movie, but for some reason, it absolutely sucks. <laughs> yeah uh so for next time just uh keep keep people abreast of what's happening with its dark disney thing next time is a watcher in the woods have you heard of that film or seen that film uh, it depends what year we're talking if, if if it's uh 2000s or 2010s maybe nah, it's 1980 nope I don't think. <laughs> okay. if i maybe i saw it when i was a kid but no it doesn't ring any bells i guess i'll just explain to a listener kind of where this idea came from which is was a uh, watcher in the woods. There's a, uh, the Ted TV series from earlier this year, which actually is quite good. Um, I wouldn't have even known it existed, but um, you know, friends I podcast with, they were actually hired by Seth MacFarlane's people to podcast that show. So I watched and listened to their podcast, but there's an episode where like, you know, Disney's kids stuff. So the older um, cousin like brings in and like, I'm going to make you piss your pants or whatever, and puts on watcher in the woods for Ted and uh, whatever Mark Wahlberg, He's not, well, Wahlberg's obviously not in the show because he's supposed to be 13 or 15 in the show. But yeah, but yeah, I saw that. So yeah, Dark Disney, let's do that for October. So that was kind of the weird impetus for, you know, me suggesting this idea in the first place. But uh, we'll see if, if watching the woods makes you crap yourself more or something <laughs> or punch it in the face. <laughs> I'm interested. I'm, I'm going to try and go in as blind as I can. Yeah, I'm going in pretty blind for these. I I did a you know just a quick reading of plot synopsis because there are some Disney dramas also from around this period, but you know I want to keep them spooky for Halloween. And then so then there's something is, like Dragon Slayer where it's only half a Disney production. So, what is the darkest of the dark Disney movies that we're doing? Probably Watcher in the Woods or something Wicked This Way Comes, which is from the Ray Bradbury book. So we'll, we'll see which of the two. Uh, it's creepier. And then Return to Oz is known for just scarring lots of children, though that one is, you know, like the black holes of sci-fi horror. That's technically a fantasy, but apparently it's a very disturbing fantasy. So, yeah. Well, ironically, the black hole should be the darkest of all the movies because that's what a black hole would be. But uh, if we had to rate it, I'd probably so far put the the black hole at like, I don't know, a, a two on the, the dark. Two Chernobogs. Scale. Two Chernobogs. Maybe, yeah, maybe two Chernobog, <laughs> maybe three Chernobogs if we're really pushing it. <laughs> I mean, I, I know they're going for Darth Vader, but you do think a little bit of Chernobog too when you see, especially um, Maximilian in, in silhouette form. And that last shot, yeah, sure. Dude, if they had given him horns and like glowing red eyes and like made him more of a, a Chernobog style, again, there's, I, it hurts me to think of all the simple little tweaks that this that we could have made. If I do find a time machine before we go back and kill Hitler, we're going to go back and we're going to punch out the director of this freaking movie and <laughs> figure out a better way. Laser to him. Show, show, show your cojones, man. You laser him right through the <laughs> chest. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm directing this movie now. Although, hey, help put me in charge of this movie. I'll probably and just you know, the fail name, miserably. <laughs> I'll probably fail miserably because I haven't directed a major motion picture. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess we will wrap up for today. Then if you want to, I, I know you got your cards. Is it, that's the main thing going now, is it? Conspiracy uh, cards? They've been popular. Yeah, I'm working on a whole bunch of more conspiracy cards. Uh, released the new... And if you want to see them, they're at conspiracycards.com. But they're basically a bunch of trading cards that are based on uh, early to mid 80s and 90s baseball cards that have got people like Ted Gunderson and Puff Daddy um, and Jose Delgado of the MK Ultra fame and Timothy McVeigh and Alex Jones and William Cooper and Bill Hicks and all the different like conspiracy legends. And I've been working on a set of cryptids as well so now we're gonna have a bigfoot and a mothman um i've even got a jersey devil in there which kind of looks uh really cool we've got albert pike we got freemasons we've got adam weissop of the bavarian illuminati so many of them uh they're probably the one of the more fun projects that i've put together and they seem to be the most popular too out of all the different things that i've been working on uh people really like them so as long as people like them and i like making them i'm gonna keep making them Oh, you can make a cryptid card of me. I mean, that's my nickname at work because I work at the branch schools. I'm almost never at the main school. So citing me is <laughs> considered a rare occasion. <laughs> so, yeah. It's just I, an I empty can... hallway. <laughs> right, right. I, I can be your cryptid card. Um, that's fun. <laughs> Yep. Uh, let's see what I have going. I mentioned a few podcasts in this episode, so I should mention those. There is uh, Films and Filth. That is where we look at the really good and really bad movies that's rated by IMDb users. Uh, I mentioned Space 1999, because how can you talk about the black hole without talking about Space 1999 a bit, especially if you just did a podcast on it, which is called Podcast 1999. And yesterday, I put out another set of binaural beats that's at rovingsagemedia.bandcamp.com. Dot com. The album is a three track collection. You're like three tracks is an album, but they're all like 25 minute long tunes of binaural beats. Uh, Journey to where? Uh, what are the song titles? The Peppermint Ashram, a dive into Medicine Lake, dreams of a far off land. I had to look at it because I didn't know what the titles were. You know, I already feel MK Ultra program just hearing the names of the titles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do it. Do it. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to fly this ship on into the black hole. Are you going to go through a crystal cathedral or are you going to end up on Metal Mountain? Uh, I wouldn't mind being fused with Maximilian. I'm not against that. Versus yeah, being stuck cool. out in space yeah, with Ernest. I mean, you know what? Ernest Borgnine's probably cool as hell, but I couldn't imagine being trapped uh, in space with him forever, especially considering some of the things that I've heard him say on hot mics. I well, I guess it's good he blew up real good then. So that's the third option: Metal Mountain, Crystal Cathedral, and being lost, or or getting vaporized in space. So I guess the last in space? one. Yeah, okay. vaporized. I mean, death is the only release. Look, you're gonna have to move fast. Conspiracy cards from Paranoid American are here. Conspiracy cards from Paranoid American, a set of over 200 cards featuring legendary conspiracy theorists, cult leaders, esoteric secrets, and more. For more details, visit conspiracycards.com today. Paranoid. Uh, huh. Yo. 
I scribble my life away, driven to write the page. Will it enlighten your brain? Give you the flight, my plane. Paper the highs ablaze. Somewhat of an amazing feel when it's real, the real. You will engage it. Your favorite, of course, the Lord of an arrangement. I gave you the proper results to hit the pavement. If they get emotional, hey, maybe your language, a game, how they playing it well without Lakers evade them. Whatever the cost, they are the shape shift. Snakes get decapitated, met is the apex. Execution of flame, you are. Nuclear bomb distributed at war. Rather gruesome for eyes to see. Max them out, then I light my trees. Blow it off in the face. You're despising me for what though? Calculated, it rather cutthroat. Paranoid American must be all the blood smoke for real. Lord, give me a day away. Vacate, they wait around to hate whatever they say. Man, it's not in the least bit we get Heavy rotate when the beat hits. So thank us, you're welcome. Fuck the niggas for real. You're welcome. They ain't never had a deal. You're welcome, man. They lacking appeal. You're welcome, yet they doing it still. You're welcome.